involved in this organization for close to 15 years. And another person who has been involved in this organization for that same length of time, from the very beginning, I'm very sorry to tell you, passed away suddenly this weekend. And it's Haiti Valentine, and she's the woman who was always pre preparing and serving the refreshments. So, in honor of her, I'd just like you to hear me say how valuable she's been, and I'm sure there'll be many more chances to celebrate her life. The, but what we're doing, because she couldn't do it, we're not having cider. <laughs> we're having water today to go with the cookies. And one thing that Haiti said to me after every meeting, would you please tell the people that Amalia makes the cookies and loves to make the cookies and hates to be the center of attention? But stand up for a minute, Amalia. <laughs> So uh, now I will hand the official program over to Grace. Hi, I'm Grace Green. I'm on the program committee, and that is my only claim to fame. Um, I was told last week that I had to use a mic, and I was so excited because nobody had ever told me that before. <laughs> um, it is, I'm going to make this introduction really short because I want you to have as much time with Garrett as possible. And because he is such a busy young man, he is running off to the airport right after this, so that we won't have time for lingering. Um, how many of you heard Greg Garrett a year ago when we had him in the Aldrich? Okay, I wonder what there is of interest in the topic today. <laughs> uh, Garrett said that we could not have planned a better date for, <laughs> for this topic than the day after something that happened last night. <laughs> so Garrett um, has many wonderful uh, items on his resume, including being the editor of um, the Washingtonian and Politico magazine. Uh, he has also written a number of books. And last year, for this group, he talked about Raven Rock, which was about doomsday plans. And now he's going back to a book that he actually wrote before that, which is called The Threat Matrix, The FBI at War, which is about Bob Mueller and, uh, as head of the FBI. Um, the interesting fact, this morning, what he was doing was he was being interviewed by Terry Gross on Fresh Air about this very topic. So he rehearsed the talk he's going to give to you with Terry Gross. <laughs> Thanks so much, Grace and Bob, uh, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, I love the chance to speak in Montpelier. Uh, I am, uh, as uh, was mentioned, a uh, proud product of the Montpelier public school system and am happy to see a number of my former teachers here uh, who, have, uh, who were sort of instrumental in helping uh, foster my intellectual life that has grown into the journalism that I do today. So thank you all uh, for the work that you did. Um, so uh, as Grace said, um, we sort of randomly selected this date um, back in what, like August or September? Um, and uh, had no idea at the time sort of how particularly and specifically relevant uh, Bob Mueller and the Russia investigation would be in, uh, uh, in this particular week amid many different weeks uh, of high levels of interest. Um, so I wanted to talk uh, today a little bit about, uh, about Mueller um, and sort of the time that I've gotten to spend with him and then uh, talk a little bit about the, sort of my high level observations about uh, what we know about the Russia investigation right now. Um, and then I, my hope is to try to spend about uh, 30 minutes freezing through that uh, and leave as much time as I can for questions. Because um, there are, uh, as anyone uh, in this room who has been following the story knows, sort of one million different threads 
uh, that we can pull on and, and talk about. So uh, I, that's the general gist of this. Uh, this is, um, uh, I've spent the last dozen years in Washington uh, and uh, up here in Vermont, uh, where I moved back about two and a half years ago, uh, covering three topics, uh, the FBI, uh, nuclear war, and Russian intelligence. And uh, for most of those dozen years, those were uh, relatively obscure topics uh, up until about two years ago, I was about the only person in the world who had paid much attention to Bob Mueller and Jim Comey's careers. Uh, and since Bob Mueller is not a particularly introspective individual, um, I, I have been joking that I've actually spent more time thinking about Bob Mueller than Bob Mueller has spent thinking about Bob Mueller. Um, uh, but he, he has become, uh, as we, we sort of all know since last May, the central figure in this uh, sort of fascinatingly classic, almost Shakespearean drama uh, between two people uh, who started in very much the same place. Um, two people born uh, just two years apart. Um, Bob Mueller is 73, uh, Donald Trump 71. Uh, both uh, Ivy educated, both heavily influenced in their careers and their lives by their fathers, uh, but two people who have uh, dedicated their lives in almost diametrically opposed uh, directions um, and uh, sort of pursuing, uh, you know, almost diametrically opposed uh, professional goals and living their lives by a value set and a moral compass that could not be more fundamentally different. Um, I came to know Bob Mueller, um, I guess actually just about 10 years ago, um, in, in 2008. Uh, almost by accident. I was uh, um, working on a piece for Washingtonian Magazine where I was working then, and we were looking to profile, I, I was literally just looking for someone to write a profile about, uh, and uh, I was trying to find someone who I knew, you know, 2008, of course, an election year, and I was trying to find someone who I knew if I was going to invest three or four months in writing a profile, I wanted it to be someone who was going to remain relevant, so not a, uh, not sort of a Bush administration person who was on their way out. And, uh, and Bob Mueller was on this fixed 10-year term as FBI director, and I sort of began to look at it, and I was like, wow, he's actually the last person standing in the job that they had on 9-11, um, which at that point was uh, sort of a significant uh, point of longevity, if, if only uh, we had no idea, of course, at the time that Bob Mueller would actually serve four more years even after that point. And so I went down to Quantico, Virginia, uh, where the FBI Academy is, to meet him uh, and to sort of watch him speak at one of the agents' graduations uh, right then. And he came up to me in the hallway and he said, you know, I just read the piece that you wrote on Tom Friedman. This was uh, sort of right after The World is Flat came out. And he said, let me tell you what The World is Flat means for the FBI. And proceeded to sort of launch into this, uh, this talk about sort of how globalization had reshaped the FBI and sort of what the rise of technology and the change in the way that the FBI was forced to do its job as a domestic law enforcement agency into an international intelligence agency uh, had, had changed uh, during the time that he had served as FBI director. And for me, it was sort of this first moment where I sort of went back on my heels, and I was like, wow, like this isn't, this is both not who I thought I was going to end up talking to, and also sort of not the story that I thought I was going to end up writing. Uh, which as a writer is sort of always one of the things that it, that's fun, is sort of finding where a story is going to take you. And so it, that led, uh, led me sort of over some time 
to uh, write from that profile into this book, which came out in 2011, um, which is the story uh, on one level of uh, Bob Mueller's time and the FBI's uh, evolution in the fight of counterterrorism, and also now sort of turns out to be the one existing biography of Bob Mueller. Um, and I, uh, I had cornered him when I decided to start writing the book at the end of 2008, I cornered him at his director's uh, uh, Christmas party. And I told him uh, that I knew that he didn't want me to write a biography of him uh, because he's not very interested in such matters and is not interested in, in talking about himself that much. And so I pitched him on the idea of uh, if he gave me access to other parts of the FBI that were more interesting than he was, I would write about this instead. And, and, and for the next two years, that, that's effectively what he did. Um, and he uh, sort of opened up a number of FBI facilities and, and allowed me to interview sort of field agents and uh, the special agents in charge and his deputies uh, and his staff and sort of developed this portrait of, of the modern FBI. Um, and so let me sort of break down uh, a little bit of his brief bio, which is probably familiar to you, and then I, I want to sort of walk through what I think are sort of the five signal Bob Mueller moments in his career. Um, he went to St. Paul's uh, in New Hampshire with, with John Kerry. Um, they played hockey together in high school. Uh, he went on to Princeton, and then um, a, a student, this was the mid-1960s, uh, early in the 1960s. So uh, before Vietnam became sort of the cultural touch point and, and, uh, and controversy that it did later in the 1960s. He, his classmate, uh, a year or two ahead of him, David Hackett, joined the Marines and went to Vietnam uh, and was killed. And that model uh, actually inspired Mueller uh, and a number of his classmates to join the Marines themselves and to go to Vietnam. And so in the mid-1960s, uh, Second Lieutenant Bob Mueller uh, finds himself in the jungles of Vietnam leading a platoon. Uh, December 1968, uh, his unit is ambushed by 200 Viet Cong. Uh, they take fire, they take casualties. Um, Mueller uh, sort of finds himself isolated leading this unit. They set up a defensive perimeter and spend hours locked in very fierce combat. Um, Muller himself leads a fire team of Marines out into enemy territory to uh, retrieve a mortally wounded comrade uh, and receives uh, out of that battle the Bronze Star with Valor. April 1969, still in combat, uh, still a second lieutenant, still with the uh, second platoon hotel company, uh, fourth uh, regiment, uh, uh, the, the a unit nicknamed the Magnificent Bastards. Uh, Muller uh, actually is shot through the thigh by an AK-47. Uh, gets a uh, uh, gets a Purple Heart. Uh, his wound is not bad enough that he even gets to visit a hospital ship, uh, as he laments later, uh, and just uh, stays uh, on recovery in. Um, at a short hospital and then takes some R&R uh, &R in Hawaii with his then young wife, Anne. Uh, he, tr he tries to tell her on the beach in Hawaii that he uh, loves the Marines and wants to spend the rest of his career as a Marine. And she informs him that that's not an option that's open to him. <laughs> and so they uh, return to United States at the end of his tour, um, and he goes to law school and uh, ends up effectively spending most of the next 50 years in, uh, in, in the Justice Department as a prosecutor, um, and works his way 
up through the 1970s and 80s as an assistant U.S. attorney, a federal prosecutor in San Francisco, transfers to uh, Boston, where he actually works for Bill Weld um, and takes over uh, when Bill Weld uh, leaves as the acting U.S. attorney uh, for Massachusetts uh, under the Reagan administration, and then comes down to Washington for the first time uh, as the assistant attorney general for the criminal division in the George H.W. Bush administration. And sees there, um, uh, he leads the trial uh, and prosecution of Manuel Noriega and the prosecution of the bombing of Pan Am 103, um, which becomes sort of one of the most important causes of his life, uh, which I'll come back to uh, in a minute. And so this is where, at the end of the uh, George H.W. Bush administration, we come to the second of the turning points uh, that I think are sort of worth highlighting. The first, of course, being his time in Vietnam. Uh, at the end of the uh, first Bush, Bush administration, he goes uh, into private practice, as is sort of typical when his job in government ends, and spends a very unhappy year in private practice um, uh, making a tremendous amount of money at the forerunner uh, uh, firm, Wilbur Hale. And uh, he was terrible at it. Um, and I talked to sort of the people who worked with him then, and he was, he just sort of couldn't stand defending people. And so one of his colleagues told me about sort of walking in with a new client and they sit down with Mueller and sort of the client lays out what the problem is and Mueller says, well, if you did that, you should plead guilty and go to jail. <laughs> and so uh, he doesn't find this the most professionally satisfying after like, his career. And so uh, he actually calls um, Eric Holder, who is then the US attorney. And part of what is sort of so fascinating about this world, as you go back, is realizing just how small these circles actually are, sort of the elite uh, sort of stars of the Justice Department, sort of how small that group is and how they sort of move around and intersect over the course of 25 years. And so Mueller calls Eric Holder, who is then the US attorney for the District of Columbia, and asks to come back as a junior prosecutor in the Homicide Division in DC. Uh, this is sort of roughly the equivalent of a two-star general retiring and then re-enlisting again as a second lieutenant. Um, and so Mueller, uh, who has led the entire criminal division for the entire Department of Justice, goes back to being uh, a, a job uh, that most prosecutors do in about their second or third year out of law school. And he, uh, to this day, uh, considers it probably the happiest time of his career. Um, you know, this was DC in the 1990s. It was an incredibly violent place, um, you know, record-setting homicide levels. And Mueller was sort of on that front line, uh, you know, out with cops at night, in the, in the courtroom, trying cases by day, and uh, sort of gradually rises back up through the ranks, becomes the head of the homicide uh, team in DC, and then eventually is actually asked by the Clinton administration to become the US attorney for the Northern District of California. The, the top federal prosecutor for San Francisco. Uh, it goes out there in the late 1990s and uh, begins to develop sort of this thing that will uh, be one of his fortes, um, which is he's a computer geek. Um, he, in 1989, read the book The Cuckoo's Egg, uh, which is sort of the first book on cybercrime and hacking. Uh, and was fascinated by it. And so when he was at the Justice Department, started the first computer crimes unit in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Then goes out to California, uh, builds the first sort of computer hacking prosecution teams out in San Francisco, uh, actually builds a new 
uh, trial software, uh, trial case software system uh, for his own office that becomes the, uh, the software for all US attorney's offices in the rest of the country. Uh, and is brought back at the beginning of the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration in 2001 as the acting deputy attorney general, um, which until uh, about a year ago is one of the most important but most obscure jobs in government. Um, believe it or not, there was actually a time when we didn't talk about the deputy attorney general every single day. Um, and whether they had a job, whether they were going to have a job at the end of the day, how they were feeling, whether they were cranky. Um, and that this was, uh, he sort of serves with John Ashcroft helping get the administration up and running at the Justice Department. And then in the summer of 2001 becomes the nominee to head the FBI. He thought at that point his job was to fix the computer system. <laughs> um, the FBI had this terribly antiquated and outdated computer system, um, such that in the summer of 2001, as FBI agents were chasing the case that we now understand with uh, uh, was the 9-11 plot, they, was, they were chasing um, uh, Al Hazmi and Al Midhar, the two uh, Al Qaeda hijackers on the West Coast, trying to find them. Uh, the FBI's uh, computer system was so antiquated that Mueller, that the agents actually had to, in order to get a file from Los Angeles to New York, an agent had to save the file to a floppy disk, get on the plane, fly to New York City, and deliver it in person. And after 9-11, the FBI uh, did not have the capability to even attach a file uh, to an email. And so uh, the FBI field offices after 9-11 had to FedEx the photos of the hijackers out to the field offices uh, to try to share information. So when Mueller is coming in in the summer of 2001, this is what he thinks his top job is going to be is fixing this computer system. He starts as FBI director, as probably everyone now knows, on September 4th, 2001. On the morning of September 11th, he is sitting in the FBI director's conference room on the seventh floor of the Hoover Building, sitting in his first briefing on Al-Qaeda and the bombing of the USS Cole. And he is interrupted and told that the, uh, a plane has hit the World Trade Center. And he uh, told me later that he looked out the window of the director's conference room at that blue sky that we all remember from that day on the East Coast. And he said, I wonder how a plane could have hit the World Trade Center on such a clear day. <laughs> and then he goes back to his briefing. And of course, you know, as the minutes unfold, it quickly becomes apparent what the uh, sort of what the day has in store. He is the first telephone call that President Bush makes from the Emma Booker Elementary School in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, President Bush calls him and says, "Bob, this is what we pay you for." The next morning, he's at the White House. Uh, and sits there uh, and begins to explain the tremendous progress that the FBI has made in identifying the hijackers, uh, beginning to trace their financial connections. And President Bush stops him and says, Bob, that's all well and good. That's exactly what I expected the FBI to be doing, and that's what the FBI has done well for 80 years. I don't care about how you're doing investigating the case. I want you to, I want to know what are you doing to stop the next one. And so it becomes this moment, this message that he gets from President Bush and from Attorney General Ashcroft, never again. And this is, uh, in my mind, sort of the third turning point uh, in his career. Um, and this is where we see Mueller uh, launch on what ultimately becomes a 12-year journey for the FBI, this uh, wrenching, amazing top-to-bottom transformation of the FBI 
from an agency that was primarily a domestic law enforcement agency into something that was uh, an international intelligence agency focused not just on investigating a crime after the fact, but on disrupting a plot to begin with. And this, uh, the, the title of my eventual book comes from the document that, the, that Bob Mueller started his day with every day after 9-11, which was an Excel spreadsheet, uh, literally an Excel spreadsheet, uh, that they called the threat matrix. And it was uh, a daily rundown of all of the terror plots that the US government was tracking that particular day, where they were unfolding, what the target was. This was a document that on an average morning uh, would stretch to dozens of pages. And I think it's incredibly important to understand the way that that document affected the mindset of every government official who interacted with it. That they woke up and spent their first uh, hours of their day studying that document, talking through how these plans would unfold, how these plots might unfold, and thinking through uh, sort of the worst case scenarios for the country on a daily basis. Um, I, I, uh, um, when I was working on the book, um, Jim Comey was out of government. He'd left the, uh, the Department of Justice. Um, and uh, again, this was during the era when no one cared about Bob Mueller and Jim Comey. So I got to spend a lot of time with Jim Comey at his office in Lockheed Martin, uh, where he was general counsel then, talking about this uh, and his time in government. And he told me the story that I think sort of best encapsulates this moment in government and the extent to which uh, we, as sort of people who lived through this moment, uh, just don't have any comprehension of the extent to which the threat matrix and that, uh, the terror and fear of that moment uh, warped and twisted the decision making of our national leaders. Um, and Comey was telling me about the night when he was Deputy Attorney General. He came home. Uh, to his house in suburban uh, Virginia. Um, all of his kids were upstairs sleeping. The house was dark. Uh, they had spent the day chasing sort of yet another dirty bomb plot, the idea that there was going to be a nuclear laced bomb exploding in the capital somewhere. And so uh, Comey is dropped off by his driver. He's walking up the, uh, 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 up the walk to his house. Uh, and he stopped and checked the wind direction to know if the dirty bomb went off overnight, would it blow the fallout towards his children or away from them? And then sort of has this moment and he stops himself and says, like, I can't believe this is how I'm now thinking. But this is what sort of this moment and living through this crucible was like. Which brings us then to sort of my next uh, turning point, which is a story that probably most of you know well uh, by this point, which is the hospital showdown um, with, with John Ashcroft uh, in March of 2004. Jim Comey comes in, takes over as FBI, or as Deputy Attorney General at the end of 2003, and moves, uh, sort of one of the things that he has to do is reauthorize all of the programs that the uh, Justice Department has to reauthorize every 90 days. Sort of particular surveillance programs uh, uh, sort of have to come up for reauthorization every 90 days and to show that they are being conducted legally and that they are bearing fruit, um, which is actually the core of part of the question of the Nunez memo. Uh, that we have unfolding right now um, is uh, sort of this question around uh, the Justice Department 90-day uh, reauthorizations. And Comey begins to look at this one particular program called Stellar Wind, which was an NSA domestic surveillance program. And he believes at that time uh, that the, it, it, it's actually an unconstitutional program. And so he goes to John Ashcroft, uh, the Attorney General, lays out his concerns. And Ashcroft agrees with him. They go to the White House. They meet with uh, Vice President Cheney, they, uh, Cheney's counsel, uh, David Addington. 
Uh, and Cheney says, in effect, uh, this program is too important. Uh, if you don't reauthorize this program, people will die. Uh, this will be on you. And Comey says, uh, effectively, you know, well, it's unconstitutional. We've got to get it back within constitutional bounds. And it, it, as this conversation is unfolding over the course of several weeks uh, and ticking down to the day when the program is deauthorized, uh, John Ashcroft goes in with emergency gallbladder uh, surgery. Uh, uh, we now understand in a way that we did not know then, John Ashcroft actually comes very close to death. And uh, he signs over the power of Attorney General to Jim Comey, his deputy. And uh, Jim Comey is sort of left on his own to fight this battle with, um, uh, with, with uh, Vice President Cheney. This becomes uh, a, a, a moment uh, that will sort of forever be remembered uh, in, this, in early March 2004 when John Ashcroft's wife calls Jim Comey as Jim Comey is driving home from work. And she calls from George Washington Hospital and says, Jim, uh, the president just called. He's sending over Andy Card, the White House Chief of Staff, and Alberto Gonzalez, the White House Counsel, uh, and they want to talk to John about Stellar Wind. She doesn't say it quite anywhere close to that because she doesn't even know what Stellar Wind is, but that's the, the message that Jim Comey hears. Jim Comey turns on the lights and siren in his motorcade, begins heading towards George Washington Hospital, and he calls Bob Mueller who is at home having dinner. And he says, Bob, I need help. I need you to come down to the hospital. Um, Mueller gets in his own motorcade, starts making his way to the hospital. You know, there are motorcades from across the Capitol beginning to descend on the hospital, lights and siren going. Jim Comey realizes that he is not going to, that Mueller is not going to make it in time. And he is afraid that the Secret Service agents who are uh, following uh, along with Andy Card as White House Chief of Staff are going to try to remove Comey from the hospital room. So he calls Bob Mueller back and says, I need you to tell the FBI agents guarding John Ashcroft not to let me be, left, not to let me be uh, removed. And so in what I sort of still think must be one of the most surreal telephone calls in the history of US government, Bob Mueller calls the agents uh, at GW Hospital, uh, who I can only imagine at that moment sort of think that they are settling in for the quietest night <laughs> of their careers, sitting, guarding an empty hospital room, or an empty hospital wing with a sedated uh, attorney general. And they get a telephone call from the FBI director saying, the Secret Service is about to be there, resist with force if necessary, <laughs> to keep Jim Comey from being removed from the room. And it, it sort of thankfully doesn't come to that at that moment. Uh, but Andy Card and Alberto Gonzalez get to the hospital room. They go to uh, John Ashcroft's bedside, ask him to sign the reauthorization. Um, he sort of rallies himself to say, you know, I, I don't think this should be reauthorized. And it doesn't matter what I think anyway, I'm not the attorney general, he is, and points over to Jim Comey. Card and Gonzalez leave and go back to the White House, and uh, Bob Mueller arrives, and John Ashcroft says to him, uh, you know, Bob, I don't understand what's going on. And uh, Mueller says, uh, you know, John, there comes a time in everyone's life when a man is tested, and tonight you passed your test. They go back to the Justice Department, Bob Mueller and Jim Comey, spend the rest of the night writing their own letters of resignation. Um, by the time the next day has rolled around, 
there are more than a dozen uh, high-level officials across the Justice Department ready to resign if this program has to go forward. Including, and again, this is sort of where we come back to the oddity of sort of what a small world this was, including Christopher Wray, who was then the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, and who, because Stellar Wind is need to know, has no idea what's going on but he stops Jim Comey in the hallway and says, Jim, I don't know what's going on, but if you're pulling the ripcord, make sure to tell me so that I can jump with you. And he knows that if Jim Comey and Bob Mueller are going, whatever it is, he doesn't even need to know. He knows that it's bad enough that he should go to. Chris Ray, of course, becomes the successor to Bob Mueller and Jim Comey uh, as the current FBI director. So this becomes, uh, it, the next day, uh, the, the Madrid train bombing happens. Uh, and you have this sort of incredibly poignant and pointed reminder of what happens when a terror plot isn't disrupted. Sort of the actual carnage that one of these plots can bring. And sort of in rattling around in Comey's mind now is this Dick Cheney line, if you don't do this, people will die. And Jim Comey and Bob Mueller go into the White House to brief the president on the Madrid train bombing. And Jim Comey pulls the president aside at the end of the meeting and says, effectively, I'm prepared to resign if Stellar Wind is reauthorized. And he and Bush talk for a few minutes, and then uh, he says, I need you to know, Mr. President, that Bob Mueller is going to resign as well. And uh, President Bush uh, almost literally blinks in that moment and sends Comey out and brings Mueller in. And Mueller and, Comey, and, Mueller and Bush talk, and at the end of that conversation, uh, we see uh, President Bush say, tell Jim to make whatever changes he thinks are necessary for the program to be constitutional. And when, uh, this story doesn't come out until years later when Jim Comey uh, is testifying uh, after his time in government with, uh, in front of the Senate, um, and Comey and a young, rising star counsel uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee known as Preet Bharara. Uh, it offers or asks uh, Comey to sort of tell this story for the first time publicly. Now, when I, this, this story was sort of public when I was starting to write my biography and I was told by someone, you're never going to understand Bob Mueller until you figure out why he was actually in that hospital room. And it was sort of a question that nagged at me as I was doing my reporting because indeed there is in fact no real reason why Bob Mueller should be in the room for a debate between the Attorney General and the Vice President over an NSA program. The fact that there is a, the, someone who is the head of a component within the Justice Department should have never been part of that conversation. And I finally had the chance to ask Jim Comey, sort of, how did Bob Mueller get to be in that hospital room? And Comey's explanation uh, has been rattling around in my head for the past year uh, for sort of two reasons, which will become self-evident. Jim Comey said, I knew that everyone would trust Bob, that he wasn't into politics, there was gonna be no hidden agenda, that if Bob Mueller told the president that something was wrong, the president would accept that it was wrong. That, that, that there was sort of no questioning Bob Mueller's motives or his moral compass. The second reason that uh, Jim Comey asked Bob Mueller to be involved in that was Comey said, I knew no one knows or cares who the deputy attorney general is. And so that person could resign and no one would notice but no president can survive the loss of an FBI director. It becomes a very interesting comment <laughs> more recently. 
So Mueller leads, uh, I'm going to sort of yada yada my way through the last eight years of Bob Mueller's tenure as FBI director, um, when he sort of led and pushed through this, uh, this transformation uh, in the spring of 2011, um, just as my brilliantly timed book was coming out <laughs> to mark the conclusion of his 10 years as FBI director, uh, he was actually asked to, by President Obama to stay on for an additional two years uh, as FBI director, which requires a special act of Congress, which passes 100 to 0 in the US Senate. Um, making Bob Mueller the longest serving FBI director since J. Edgar Hoover himself, uh, and someone uh, who has now been appointed and held top jobs under the last five American presidents. So Bob Mueller goes into private practice uh, after uh, his time as FBI director um, and ends up back at Wilmer Hale, the law firm he was so unhappily at earlier. <laughs> and he ends up uh, being asked by the NFL in sort of one of his first big cases to investigate the Ray Rice domestic violence incident, if you remember that. Uh, and authors what uh, is probably the first of uh, what we will call in history the Mueller Report. And the Mueller report, I think, is an incredibly instructive document today because of the way that it's, we see how tenaciously Bob Mueller investigated that incident. And uh, the report spends five pages talking about how the NFL mailroom accepts mail and signs for packages. And I sort of have joked that like Bob Mueller probably knows things about the NFL mailroom that the NFL mailroom employees don't know. And that that's really the, sort of the style of investigator that he is. Um, well, the other thing that I think is really instructive there that's worth paying attention to is Bob Mueller interprets the most narrow version of his task, which was he was asked by the NFL to weigh in on how they handled the Ray Rice domestic violence incident. And he did exactly that, and he didn't go one step further. He didn't get into any of the larger questions about the NFL's uh, 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 sort of how it treats domestic violence. He didn't get into anything about how the teams uh, you know, handled domestic violence. He didn't get into anything about sort of the larger, even Ray Rice case. Um, and so I think one of the things that that teaches us about today is that Bob Mueller doesn't do fishing expeditions. That if he is pursuing something, he sees it as core and central to the case that he's trying to build. And that this is, I think, an incredibly important and instructive way to begin to look at its investigation. So let me sort of real quickly run through a, a couple of points about sort of where the investigation lands today. And then um, I do want to leave a little bit of time for, for questions, as I said. So um, what we see unfolding right now uh, is, is sort of a quintessential classic FBI investigation that what the FBI does is it takes down corrupt organizations. And it, it, it is an agency designed for going after street gangs, organized crime families, and drug cartels. And so the way that it does that is it starts on the outside and at the bottom. And then sort of you work your way in sort of concentric circles into the center of an investigation. And you sort of apply pressure at the edges and work your way into the center. And that's exactly what we have seen happen so far, where you both have Bob Mueller starting at the almost literal bottom of the campaign with George Papadopoulos, and on the outside with Paul Manafort and Rick Gates' <laughs> alleged money laundering scheme unrelated to the 2016 campaign. Sort of both of these become pressure points that Bob Mueller can use to sort of get closer to the center of an investigation. And this is sort of exactly what we would expect a, uh, an FBI investigation to unfold. 
The second thing that I think is really important to realize uh, is that everything that we have seen thus far is sort of the prosecutorial equivalent of low-hanging fruit. That the Paul Manafort and Rick Gates indictment is uh, effectively, they, I'm vastly oversimplifying a very complex prosecution by incredibly talented people who know far more about finances than I do. They sent out some subpoenas, they got some documents back, they went into a room, read the documents, and came out and indicted Paul Manafort and Rick Gates. <laughs> That there's sort of no testimony or witnesses involved with this. This is a very black and white money laundering case. Secondly, they've gone after what you see are the 1001 violations. These, the uh, sort of the basic federal criminal charge of lying to federal investigators, which is like the one thing that you really aren't supposed to do in an FBI investigation, and they take very seriously and really, really. Uh, get angry about, but are easily provable because you lie to them, they prove you're lying, and boom, you have a 1001 violation. So then sort of the next thing that I think sort of stands out is that at every stage of this investigation, Bob Mueller has demonstrated that he knows far more than we think he does. And that uh, sort of for all of the coverage and the stories about leaks from the investigation, it's actually quite clear that Bob Mueller's team isn't leaking at all. That Mueller has uh, brought forward uh, at each stage surprising charges. You know, the fact that uh, Mueller uh, was able to arrest, get the cooperation of, and plead, uh, come up with a plea deal for George Papadopoulos before anyone paid any attention to George Papadopoulos is actually a pretty significant investigative uh, sign of where this case is going to go. Uh, relatedly, the fact that we only found out last week that Jim Comey had testified in front of Mueller's team uh, weeks ago is significant. It, you know, it shows that sort of at every stage of this, Bob Mueller knows more than we think he does. Uh, that the investigation is sort of further along and has more detail than we think. Relatedly, we know that there are at least two very significant pieces of evidence that we know exist that we don't know what they are yet. Which is the George Papadopoulos gave some very significant piece of information uh, in order to get his plea deal. Um, at which he could have faced up to five years in federal prison. Uh, he is currently uh, going to be sentenced to something between zero and six months. Uh, so sort of one way to look at it is he gave Bob Mueller something that is worth four and a half years in federal prison. <laughs> um, secondly, Paul uh, Michael Flynn gave some significant piece of information that we don't know yet what it is. But in the annals of federal prosecution, you don't get credit for what is called cooperating down. That is uh, sort of providing incriminating or corroborating evidence against people lower down in the scheme than you are. Michael Flynn was the national security advisor at the White House. The pool of people above him uh, probably can be counted on one hand depending on how you define it. Then the uh, sort of the last two things that I would sort of point out about the investigation and then uh, take some questions. It, the first is that there, uh, we sort of speak of the Mueller probe as one thing, but it is at least five different separate investigations. Um, you have, uh, sort of based on publicly available information, uh, we see that there's a money laundering investigation that's unfolding in the midst of this. We see that there is an obstruction investigation unfolding in the middle of this. We see that there is a hacking investigation unfolding in the middle of this, uh, which may or may not also involve WikiLeaks, may or may not involve Podesta's email may or may not involve the Russian hacking teams Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear. 
then we also know that there is a social media uh, and sort of influence operations investigation unfolding in this based on some of the, uh, the details of um, the uh, subpoenas that have gone out to Facebook, uh, to Cambridge Analytica, um, the, the Trump campaign's data team, and then there's sort of the like fifth sort of uh, perhaps related, perhaps unrelated line uh, of question of actual Russian influence in the Trump campaign um, involving uh, perhaps Carter Page, uh, the uh, foreign policy advisor, perhaps George Papadopoulos, uh, perhaps Jeff Sessions' meetings with Sergei Kislyak, um, sort of all of these different uh, strange and as yet unexplained uh, moments. So when we sort of speak of the Mueller probe, I think it's important to delineate that there are at least five different threads of this investigation, some of which are not yet public at all, but we know that Mueller is pursuing. And then sort of the last thing that I would say um, is I think it's also important to <laughs> to realize that Bob Mueller has a very limited job here, even if Bob Mueller only does the job in front of him, which is Bob Mueller's job is to figure out whether there are provable federal crimes, which is you know, something that can be charged in a federal courtroom in front of a jury that can be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that criminal activity has happened. Bob Mueller is not, offer, not after political problems. There is a whole level of behavior uh, that we as a country and as a democracy can decide is behavior we do not want the President of the United States to be engaged in or a party to that falls short of a federal crime that can be convicted in a court of law with uh, a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. And this is a point that actually Sally Yates, uh, the last deputy attorney general to be fired, uh, has been making over the last year, which is sort of ultimately we need to remember that this is a political question, not a criminal one. And that we as a country sort of both have, a, have to come up with a question of what do we believe is acceptable behavior in our leaders either on the campaign trail uh, or in office. Yeah. So um, I'm going to leave it there. I think I have talked, well, I definitely have talked much longer uh, than I meant, but I can take maybe about 10 minutes of questions here. Can you yeah. explain the Nunes uh, lap right now? Yeah, so this is Devin Nunez, uh, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, who, uh, remember, last year uh, breathlessly reported that he had uncovered uh, a secret cabal of Justice Department officials who were seeking to undermine the president and raced to the White House to tell the president of that cabal, only to later admit that he had learned of the cabal from the White House <laughs> before he raced back to tell them about it. So Devin Nunez uh, has uncovered another secret cabal uh, of the justice inside the Justice Department that is, he believes, a wide-ranging conspiracy to undermine the uh, Trump administration, uh, oddly led by Rod Rosenstein, the Trump appointee, uh, that he um, to sort of that they were uh, sort of uh, falsely and illegally relying upon this steel dossier, this controversial uh, series of memos created by a former MI6 operative named Christopher Steele. Um, and that Devin Nunez uh, has not only uncovered this secret plot, uh, but has managed to write it down in three and a half pages, 
And uh, now the House Republicans are sort of racing to try to make this memo public. Adam Schiff, who is the ranking Democrat on the committee, uh, has written his own memo uh, laying out how selectively edited the memo is that Devin Nunez has written. And the House Republicans will not release Adam Schiff's memo at the same time that they released Devin Nunez's memo. And that at some point in the next couple of days, uh, we expect this memo to become public. Uh, the Justice Department has expressed, again, the, the Trump Justice Department has expressed concern that it uh, sort of falsely represents uh, and compromises sources and methods in the intelligence community. And the FBI today objected to the memo as being outright false, um, not complaining about the sources and methods, but actually just saying that the conclusion of the memo is incorrect. Yeah. And, and this is sort of one of the things, and I, I, I'll give you sort of a one yeah. minute version of FISA. So this is the, the sort of central question we believe about the Nunez memo, mm -hmm. is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act protocols for gathering intelligence on US persons inside the United States. So this is a series, this is a law that came about uh, in the post-Watergate era that outlines the one and only legal way to gather intelligence within the United States. And that is to get a FISA warrant in front of the secret FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISC. And the, uh, sort of there, one of the things that the congressional Republicans have been saying over the last couple of weeks is sort of making you think that the Obama White House took the Steele dossier, like signed their name across the top, and handed it into the FISA court to get a FISA warrant to spy on Carter Page, who was a campaign advisor at the time. Um, most people don't realize that actually a FISA warrant is actually even more restrictive and more difficult to get than a regular warrant. Um, having covered this area, I can tell you that any agent who is able to figure out a way to get anything not by getting a FISA warrant will do that. That the FISA warrant is this incredibly high bar to clear in order to utilize intelligence resources to gather information on US persons. The FISA warrant, this is where we come back into the 90 day reauthorizations. The FISA warrant is only good for 90 days and needs to be renewed every 90 days with evidence that the previous 90 days have shown that the target of the FISA warrant was uh, serving as an intelligence asset to a foreign power. So that warrant on Carter Page might have started as early as 2016. Uh, it went right through the beginning of the Trump administration, sort of part of what we believe is going to come out in this memo, is that Rod Rosenstein himself reauthorized that FISA warrant um, during one of these 90-day reauthorizations about a year ago, which means, actually, uh, that it was an incredibly fruitful warrant if it was continuing to bear fruit over that length of time, uh, and that Rod Rosenstein looked at it, saw evidence that there were sort of Russian ties involved in this warrant, and that it uh, went, it, you know, that he was willing to let it move forward. Um, so it's sort of, as of 2.30 on Wednesday, that's the best summary that I can give you <laughs> of the Nunez memo. It might be incredibly different by 5 p.m. today, and we'll sort of wait and see what it says. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out uh, that the, uh, the Republicans in Congress have a, a 
apparently very explicit goal of trying to muddy these waters as best they can to make it seem like things are nefarious that are in fact not. All right, uh, back there. Uh, charges have been brought uh, uh, against Michael Flynn et al. Yes. Where does that, where does Mueller's authority end in actually bringing charges? At the president or or are there levels down from that? Yeah, so, that's a, so it's, a, it's a complicated legal question. Um, Bob Mueller theoretically can charge any individual with a crime. Uh, under Justice Department protocols, that probably doesn't include the president. Uh, there are two advisory memos, one from the Watergate era, one from the, 2000, from the 1990s, that hold that the president cannot be charged, the president as the head of the executive branch cannot be charged by the executive branch with a crime. Um, that, uh, that has never been tested in court. Um, Bob Mueller evidently has access to a memo that Ken Starr's team came up with that argues the opposite. Um, but that, uh, you know, I would guess that Bob Mueller is not going to try to, uh, as someone who has spent his entire life for 50 years working inside the Justice Department, I would find it hard to believe that Bob Mueller is going to come up with uh, at the end of his career, a novel and untested theory that exceeds the existing Justice Department protocols. What he can do is hand over evidence to the Department of Justice to then hand over to Congress. Yeah. Um, this is a bit more of a political question, but the Republicans uh, are doing everything they can to try to undermine Mueller who has such a uh, outstanding reputation and is a Republican, um, is that a sign of how desperate they're feeling to uh, keep uh, Trump in place? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, well, so I, I guess I'll, uh, yeah, so the, the question is, um, in, in effect, sort of, what's the deal with smearing Bob Mueller? Um, and, and I think that sort of the, the answer to that is like, in, in some ways, like the simplest answer I can give is anyone who has spent any time around law enforcement in general, uh, let alone the FBI specifically, or federal law enforcement, uh, who thinks that federal law enforcement is controlled by a democratic secret society uh, doesn't have much understanding of the culture of uh, what is probably the most traditionally conservative institution in the United States. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, it would be news to Bob Mueller that he is a democratic uh, stooge. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of talk about the football. Now, what's the story now? Is it still the same as it was? They took it away from Nixon, you said, two weeks before he was signed. Yeah, so th this is a, um, I, maybe I'll close with that question and I'll take one more Mueller question and then okay. change to a uh, equally uplifting topic of nuclear war. Um, <laughs> a, any final Mueller question? Yeah. What about the Democratic memo? Uh, so the Democratic memo uh, that Adam Schiff has written, um, yeah, sort of simply the, the Democrats don't have the votes to vote out their memo. Um, and so there is no process through which that can be uh, released. Um, the one mechanism that is available uh, would be if a uh, member of Congress actually wanted to read the memo out loud on the floor of the House or Senate, where members are protected from disclosing classified information. Um, so we'll sort of see if that happens. Um, 
Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. Because I, I sort of say that like half jokingly and half not. Because for the first six months that I talked about this last year, my literal line was, it's not like there's going to be an email from the Russians to the Trump Organization <laughs> saying, we're the Russians and we'd like to help you. <laughs> and then it turns out that not only does that email exist, but that the president's son replied, I love it, all in caps. And the world just kept on spinning. So I have really sort of given up trying to put odds or make bets on any of this uh, sort of since then. Um, so let me, I'll sort of close uh, down here with the, the one question on sort of my other uplifting book um, on the US government's plans for doomsday. Um, and, and the question was sort of, you know, has anything changed in the way the presidents uh, uh, treat nuclear war? Um, and the sort of short answer is no. Like the presidential nuclear command authority uh, remains entirely uh, unilateral. Um, and that uh, there have been sort of some moves inside Congress to try to change those systems going forward to perhaps uh, insist that there be a uh, um, like a declaration of a congressional declaration of war before a president can launch nuclear weapons, uh, but those that have not moved forward at all. Um, and I think it's uh, instructive, and I sort of wrote about this last week, that the uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, last week announced that the doomsday clock, sort of their rough marker on how close we are to global catastrophe was reset last week uh, in its annual resetting at two minutes to midnight, which is the closest and sort of most dire risk that the world has faced in their estimation since uh, 1953 when Russia and the United, the Soviet Union and uh, the United States tested a thermonuclear uh, bomb for the first time. So on that note, um, <laughs> but as, as Grace uh, mentioned, um, if you want to hear me repeat most of the things I just told you, um, you can listen uh, tomorrow on Terry Gross on Fresh Air. Um, I think you have heard almost everything I said there, but there might be a couple of additional details uh, on Mueller uh, that uh, come out there. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm sorry I didn't have to